the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening. My name is Helene Guys Marquez, and I'm the director of the Center for Adult Life and Learning here at the 92nd Street Y. First, just a little bit of business, if you don't mind. On your laps or somewhere should be our catalog, our spring catalog for the Center for Adult Life and Learning only. If you haven't received a whole Y catalog, you can certainly pick one up in the lobby. I hope that for those of you who have both looked at the catalog already and for those of you who have not, uh, you'll take a, a good look. Uh, sometimes we look at the things that we're used to looking for and, and don't look past it. And I think that, that um, you may be missing out on some things that you'd like to do. Remember, we have tours, wonderful tours, walking and bus tours. We have a tour going off to uh, Costa Rica and down to Charleston for the Spoleto Festival. All kinds of wonderful things if you take a, a minute and look through. There is one thing that is not in, in uh, that catalog or in the whole Y catalog, and that is a new lecture that we just uh, planned or were able to schedule last week. It will be on Wednesday evening, April 7th, and it will be Charlie Rose interviewing Dustin Hoffman. I know, it's very exciting. <laughs> he was here seven years ago, and my colleague Susan Engel has been trying to get him back ever since, and finally I think they were just tired of getting so much mail from us, and he, he gave in. Um, again, that will be on Wednesday evening, April 7th. If you want to buy tickets, they should be on sale tomorrow or, when, or Wednesday. Uh, call 996-1100 and, and get them. We've been, you're the third audience we've told in our senses that we will probably sell out just by by these announcements to our current audiences. $16 like all of our lectures. Thanks. Um, okay, that's it. This is um, one of our series that, that we do for the past couple of years in cooperation with the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, it is a uh, collaboration, a cooperation that has really worked uh, we are very proud to have them as our partner, and um, the, the lecturers who have come to us from Israel have been just so stellar in their, in their, scholar, in their, their scholarliness, and so I look forward to this particular series. Uh, as we do with these, it is my pleasure not to introduce, well, although it would be my pleasure to introduce the speaker, but I instead I get to introduce the, the person who will introduce the speaker, um, which is also a pleasure, always. Our introducer for this evening is the um, chairman of the American Friends of Hebrew University Freud Center Associates. He is a practicing psychoanalyst and on the faculty of the Columbia Center of Psychoanalytic Training and Research. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Evan Bellin. Good evening. <clears throat> uh, our task this evening uh, is uh, to take a voyage into the uh, tricky, radical, and revolutionary thinking of Sigmund Freud and his influence on the modern and postmodern world. Our guide on this voyage is the director of the uh, Sigmund Freud Center at the Hebrew University, Professor Shmuel Ehrlich. Dr. Ehrlich himself is a graduate of the Israeli Psychoanalytic Society, and he is training and supervising analysts there. His own scientific interests are largely in the area of psychology of adolescence, and he has contributed much to the literature both in Israel and abroad. We have been following Dr. Ehrlich's multiple contributions over the past 15 years to the psychoanalytic study of the child, for example, where he has been writing about maternal longing in adolescence, the metapsychology of experience, denial in adolescence, the wish for fusion, and most recently, reality fantasy in adolescence. Dr. Ehrlich is also 
an international authority on group and organizational process, largely influenced by the Tavistock Institute. He recently addressed the German Psychoanalytic Association on the issue of the rise of hatred of the stranger since German reunification. He also has recently discussed regression in organizations at the recent Summit Institute conference in Jerusalem on narcissism and the individual, the group, and the organization. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Professor Shmuel Ehrlich. Good evening. Um, it is a real pleasure for me personally, and I take it as a tribute uh, to the Sigmund Freud Center of the Hebrew University to be the first speaker in this promising uh, series sponsored by the Friends of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in New York. Now, I've called my talk tonight The Freudian Revolution, an homage to unpopular ideas. I think, I hope this will become clearer as we go. To launch this series with a talk on Sigmund Freud may appear in some respects to be a somewhat skewed presentation of historical assessment. Of the three great Jewish minds that may be said to have influenced and shaped the 20th century, Karl Marx, Albert Einstein, and Sigmund Freud, Freud's influence and impact may be regarded by many as the smallest and certainly the more esoteric of the three. It is difficult to compare it, for example, to the impact of the social and economic philosophy expounded by Marx with its message of class struggle and the redistribution of the ownership of economic power. Psychoanalysis cannot be said to have changed the world map and the politics of nations and social class for most of the century in the way socialism did. All of us have just lived through the undreamed and unexpected downfall of the East European socialist communist empire and can still remember how it affected our own lives and the lives of millions living within its oppressive walls, secret police and gulags. Similarly, Einstein's vis uh, revision of the cosmical physical map leading to an unleashing of new and unfathomed forces of fission, revolutionizing our most fundamentally held truths regarding the nature of time and space, has certainly had a much greater and more evident effect on 20th century life in unraveling new sources of power that can be derived from the physical world, and in the tremendous leap in our capacity to understand and master the physical world in which we live. And yet, people speak of the Freudian revolution, and I think rightly so, as one of those forces that changed this century, and perhaps all those to come, in some essential way. What is this change? And what, if anything, does it have in common with these other revolutions? Most fundamentally taken, the change we speak of, and which is common to all three, I think, of these creative minds, has to do with a basic shift in the perception of man and his perspective of his nature and place in the universe. On this dimension, these three men created or set off the most profound revolution since Copernicus, Kant, and Darwin. Einstein and Marx, however, 
focused primarily on man's exchange and intercourse with the material world in which he lives, the world of nature and of the goods and services produced by man. It fell to Freud to undertake the exploration of man himself as an old, new, and not fully charted continent. The journey undertook by Freud was into the mind and spirit of man. The pride and prejudice of this internal journey is that it sees itself, whether rightly or wrongly, as the prime cause for all the others. It regards this internal plane, its forces and conditions, as what determines, essentially, what man actually does in the reality in which he lives. Why Freud? Why, you may well ask, did it fall to this particular man to spend his long life stubbornly, dedicatedly, and giftedly in the pursuit of this end? Why did he, of all people, become the founder and spiritual father of a new discipline, one so utterly and fully a 20th century discipline? Now, several reasons may be offered, all of which are essentially biographical and closely related to his personal life and development. And I will now go briefly through these. I would place Freud's Jewishness as first among these factors. A good deal has been said and written about this, but perhaps the words that best capture it are Freud's himself. The occasion on which these words were uttered was the celebration of his 70th birthday by the Viennese B'nai B'rit Society. Now Freud had been a member of this society since 1895 and he had attended regularly for many years, twice a month or so, giving lectures and presentations on a number of occasions. In fact, he told them that they were his first and most loyal audience. In his address on this occasion, which incidentally was not delivered by himself because he was too ill to attend, but it was read. Freud says, and I quote, what bound me to Jewry was neither faith nor national pride, for I have always been an unbeliever and was brought up without any religion, though not without respect for what are called the ethical standards of human civilization. But plenty of other things remained over to make the attraction of Jewry and Jews irresistible. Many obscure emotional forces, which were the more powerful, the less they could be expressed in words, as well as a clear consciousness of inner identity. Incidentally, the first time the word identity is used in the psycholytic literature is right here. Beyond this, there was a perception that it was to my Jewish nature alone that I owed two characteristics that had become indispensable to me in the difficult course of my life. Because I was a Jew, I found myself free from many prejudices which restricted others in the use of their intellect. And as a Jew, I was prepared to join the opposition and to do without agreement with the, quote, compact majority, unquote. It was pointed out much later by Eric Erickson that this was, as I said, the only time the first and only time Freud had used the word identity in, quote, a more than incidental way. When he tried to formulate his link to the Jewish people, he spoke of an inner identity which was not based on race or religion, but on a common readiness to live in opposition 
and on a common freedom from pre prejudice which narrow the use of the intellect. Unquote. I should like to add that the intellect or the intellectual freedom that Freud so cherished was also closely linked by him with the capacity to withstand adversity, loneliness, and persecution. The second factor, which may perhaps strike you as odd in the context of this Jewishness, is Freud's Germanness. Now, Freud was very much a product of the best that German culture had to offer, a fact which was reflected in his receiving the Goethe Prize in 1930 for his achievements in German culture. He mastered its language and cultural idiom, absorbed its great writings and creations, and shared its admiration for other cultures, ancient, Mediterranean, English, and so on. But he also had the Germanic penchant for a certain roundness of phrase or weightiness of pronouncement, which at times might be valued no less than the strictly empirical or dry fact. I venture to say that had Freud been English, or lived in America, he probably would have never invented or discovered psychoanalysis, although he may well have in invented or discovered something else. The Central European, Germanically shaped culture within which he grew up played such a central part in the edifice he erected that one of the currently hot debates is around the many distortions in sense and meaning that stemmed from the translation of Freud into English. Now the third influential factor in Freud's background that prepared him for the kind of psychoanalytic discoveries he was to make was his education and training. His university training brought him squarely within the sphere of influence of the so-called Helmholtz School, which undertook the cause of investigating and understanding mental phenomena from the point of view of material science. This implied an unwavering allegiance to positivistic approach and to the most materialistic determinism in psychological matters. At the same time, however, Freud was also exposed to the phenomenological teachings of the great Brentano. Beyond this scientific philosophical stance, Freud's course of training was one of a laboratory assistant, a researcher in physiology, where he made such important discoveries, as you probably know, as that of cocaine and the nerve axon, and finally, as a physician specializing in neurological disorders. These steps in his career developed in him a lifelong outstanding capacity for observation rather than an experimental approach. He put this habit to minute, careful, and detailed observation well to use in his practice, first of neurological cases, and later of patients in psychoanalysis at the various stages of the development of this technique. Now the last factor I will mention with regard to what made Freud the founder and discoverer of psychoanalysis is his self-analysis. This feat, which in some ways is a contradiction in terms, I mean, nobody nowadays would uh, even concede that it is possible to do such a thing as a self-analysis in a true sense of the word. This feat was undertaken by Freud in the mid-1890s and engaged in systematically from 1897 on. It is described by Peter Gay in his biography of Freud as, I quote, an act of patient heroism to be admired and palely imitated, but never repeated, 
It is the founding act of psychoanalysis, unquote. Freud's earlier biographer, Ernst Jones, is no less laudatory. I quote, it is hard for us nowadays to imagine how momentous this achievement was, he writes, that difficulty being the fate of most pioneering exploits. Yet the uniqueness of the feat remains. Once done, it is done forever, for no one again can be the first to explore these depths, unquote. It is not really necessary for us to go into the details of Freud's discoveries about himself in the course of this heroic undertaking. Generally speaking, it is clear that he was able to recover certain early childhood memories tinged with eroticism and competition. It is equally clear that his coming up with these particular discoveries was largely responsible for his placing the Oedipal issues, or complex as he referred to it, in a central place in the development, or in development in general, and in neurogenesis, that is in the etiology of neurosis in particular. Now Freud persisted in these views throughout his life and work, and the Oedipus complex became the cornerstone for what has come to be called classical psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic theory. I will return to this later. Before we turn to the revolutionary aspects of Freud's discoveries, it is important to review, however briefly, some of the characteristics of psychoanalysis as a science and a theory. Now, it may perhaps surprise some of you, but Freud considered his psychoanalytic method, first and foremost, the method for the study and research of the human mind and its psychology, and only secondarily, the method for the treatment and therapy of its aberrations. This sameness of the method used for investigation, for data collection, and for testing and validating it, makes for unusually close links, for interdependence and possible circularity between psychoanalysis as a theory and as the methodology employed to validate this theory. Some of the fiercest critiques of psychoanalysis have indeed been around this very issue, which in the terminology of the philosophy of science is referred to as the interpenetration of the context of discovery with the context of validation and refutation. It's a very high sounding phrase, but essentially it says what I just said before, that you use the same method for data collection and for establishing the data. There's no independent way of testing the theory. These critics have raised the objection that this state of affairs makes it virtually impossible to subject psychoanalytic theory to the usual scientific criteria of proof and disproof, or of valid validation and refutation, and that this puts psychoanalysis beyond the pale of science. This is ironic, of course, in view of Freud's professed adherence, as I said, to the spirit and principle of science. Now, as a science, psychoanalysis is certainly in a very unique position. It has not made up its mind fully whether it is a natural science, as Freud preferred to see it, or a hermeneutic one. The latter implies that it does not rely on causality as an explanatory tool, but on the application and creation of meaning. It is, in many ways, a post-dictive science, like history, geology, and archaeology, and not at all, or not sufficiently so, a predictive one. 
such as physics or astronomy might be. It is also not really a theory in the strict sense of this term. Rather, it consists of several models loosely and unsystematically linked and connected with one another. The fact that the different models are additive and not contradictory to one another is expressed in the principle of overdetermination, which states that a given behavior or symptom is actually determined by a number of contributing factor, factors. This must lead to the merging and amalgamation of varying findings and not to a forced choice between competing models and evidence. But what is perhaps most characteristic of psychoanalysis and atypical of science in general is that this entire edifice rests upon one man's work and creation. I think it is unparalleled in scientific development that 100 years after its creation, an entire field still rests upon the foundations laid down by a single man, observations, clinical cases, deductions and inductions, theory building and theory revision. In this sense, Freud's work has indeed been monumental and its effects are still well felt. It is difficult to find an area of psychoanalytic interest or relevance that has not been pioneered and had its ground broken by him. The question we must ponder now is, why do these Freudian discoveries deserve the epitaph of a revolution? And in what ways did they indeed alter our understanding of ourselves? It is here, I'm afraid, that we come to the more difficult part of our discussion. It is this part, with the resistance and disbelief that it still arouses, although I certainly hope this audience is free of such resistance and disbelief, but just in case, um, that led me to subtitle this lecture, as I said, an homage to unpopular ideas. These ideas, which I will touch on all too briefly, include the place and role of instinctual drives, the predetermined caste of human development, the unconscious, infantile sexuality and its implications, and finally, the nature of rationality, reality, and one's own experience. Obviously, I mean, these are, I've just listed some of the major themes of psychoanalytic theory, and I assure you we will not spend all night discussing them. So it's going to be, I'm going to take each one up at rather briefly. Now, the centerpiece of Freud's theoretical and clinical edifice is his theory of instinctual drives. Deeply influenced by the evolutionary models of Spencer, Darwin, and Hulene Jackson in neurology, Freud approached man's psychological development from the biological side. His adherence to materialism meant that complex psychical phenomena were to be explained in terms of the differentiations that evolved in living organisms through the operation of biological forces. These then, these forces then gave rise to such functions as the need for survival and adaptation, sexual activity in the service of species preservation, and the biophysiological cycles of activity and quiescence so characteristic of such organisms. These basic forces are credited with being the source of all action and motivation, of love and hate relationships, 
as well as of continued differentiation and cultural achievements. In the course of his theoretization, these forces, or instinctual drives, several times changed their names and meaning, as well as their op opponents <coughs> in the conflicts they set off. There were, for instance, ego instincts of self-preservation in conflict with sexual or libidinal ones, various sexual partial drives emerging in close association with bodily erotogenic zones, eventually united under the hegemony of mature genital sexuality, narcissism versus libido, and both of them pitted against the ego instincts, and eventually two abstract, semi-philosophical, cosmic forces conceptualized as life and death instincts, as eros and thanatos, manifested in men as a sexual drive and a destructive or aggressive drive. Now, while this must sound quite confusing, the main point is that these drives generate conflicts, and that these conflicts and the manner and methods of coping with them are responsible for both the complexity of the human mind and for its tendency toward neurosis and psychopathology. Furthermore, the inherent nature of these drives means that conflict is in essence unavoidable and an essential component of being human. The uneasy implication is, of course, that human nature does not really allow for an ongoing, endlessly blissful, paradisical state. Though this may already have been the message contained in the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and their eventual expulsion from it, it is still, I think, a difficult message to accept without turning cynical or pessimistically sour. There is yet another difficult to bear implication of the instinctual drive notion, however. I refer to the message of the close connectedness and limited ascent of man, biologically speaking, from his fellow creatures. To regard instinctual drives and conflicts as the flywheel of civilization and cultural development brings us uncomfortably close to our biology, even where such lofty achievements as thought, language, culture, and creativity are concerned. The glorious cultural achievements of human society are thus reduced, in Freud's thinking, to being the products of infantile needs. An important example of this is religion, which Freud mostly denied and rejected, especially in its institutional and dogmatic forms. Religion, in his, in his view, is the cultural outgrowth of infantile and childish needs for a powerful father, or in its neo-Freudian caste, as stemming from the earliest need for basic trust and belief, for a numinous presence, and for hope. To view God as a projection of internal needs, devoid of any supernatural external standing, was certainly heralded by other thinkers, such as Nietzsche, for example. Yet it was truly revolutionary in a world that for thousands of years has taken an opposite stance and to a large extent still does, particularly as it did not come out of philosophical considerations, but from an integrated biopsychological, clinical, and empirical perspective. Now Freud's discovery and introduction of the unconscious 
was not, strictly speaking, totally new. The notion that a portion of the mind is outside of normal consciousness had been around for centuries. In these pre-Freudian notions, however, the mind, in the sense of agency and psychological activity, was equated with consciousness. Ideas, for instance, might be temporarily kept out of consciousness, forming an apperceptive mass, and would be actualized only insofar as they entered the conscious mind. That notion has, had been around. Freud's notion of the unconscious is not a static container in which ideas are kept dormant and out of awareness until summoned into consciousness. The Freudian unconscious, or later the id, is vital and dynamic with ideas, wishes, and images that are very much alive and kicking. In fact, it forms the base and the major portion of a pyramid or an iceberg of mental activity of which the conscious part is merely the top or the tip. The interplay of forces within the unconscious is therefore a more powerful determinant of our actions than the conscious part of our mind. Again, a somewhat uneasy notion to entertain. The unconscious operates according to different rules from those that govern our waking or conscious sensibilities. The conscious mind, subsequently associated with the functions of the ego, operates in close relationship to external reality and its demands. It therefore knows itself to be essentially rational aware, reality-oriented, and adaptive in its concerns, pursuits, and methods. Our conscious mind is in fact so devout in its worship of reality that its overruling tendency is to abhor irrationality, to fear and suspect the forces that may pull it in directions not clearly in the service of adaptation and to reject and eject such processes from its own sphere. Now, nowadays, our conscious mind does not, of course, rule out anymore, in principle, the existence of an unconscious sphere of the mind. We are all very familiar with it, thanks to Freud. Yet it unusual, it, I'm sorry, yet it usually accepts this, our conscious mind, only in others and not in its own backyard. This is clearly still difficult to accept in more than a superficial or glib manner. The discovery of infantile sexuality was always seen by Freud as one of his greatest and most lasting achievements. I will only touch here on one of its central aspects and implications. I refer, as I said before, to the Oedipus complex. The inevitability of the passage through this central gateway of childhood and of human development in general stems, of course, from the unavoidable presence and impact of the instinctual drives, both sexuality and aggression. It also is unavoidable in the sense that we are all raised in nuclear families. But even if we were not, the notion of an Oedipus complex is still central. The undoing of the Oedipal child's aspirations for love and possession of his love object is the so-called grand disillusionment that is bound up with a child's smallness the immaturity of his sexual and loving capacities. This disillusion is usually further buttressed by the taboo 
on incest, which enlists the weight of culture and society in support of this disillusionment. Now we are all aware of the horrors and difficulties that ensue where these prohibitions of incest are not fully maintained and the child's disillusionment does not come about by his being denied sexual prerogatives for the time being, but from his being used or abused as a full sexual partner, leading to disillusionment of a very different kind. The point I wish to stress, however, is the residual lifelong difficulty that the Oedipal issue creates in the normal course of events. In the normal course of events, the child is disillusioned by the realization that even if he or she is loved by the parent, it is essentially or merely parental love for a child and no more. The prerogatives of intimacy and the exciting secrets of adult sexuality must be delayed and postponed to that point in time when the child will have reached adult size and status. Psychoanalytically speaking, this means that the child realizes his childish and imperfect state and can identify with the adult. The process will leave, however, an abiding sense also of his own smallness and imperfection in comparison to another who is bigger, stronger, more potent, or better privileged. It is easy to see how all kinds of feelings of entitlement, envy, and inferiority are intrinsically woven into this fabric but also how it can foster a capacity for postponement of gratification, for developing a clear sense of morality and generational boundaries, and for identification with power and achievement. Indeed, this intergenerational struggle and repetitive confrontation presents a challenge to any social order. Every society copes in its own way with the issues of young and old, small and big, weak and powerful, leaders and followers, the wielding of authority and its acceptance by others. Every society resolves these issues in its own way, and this solution forms the presenting face and visiting card of that society. Such solutions vary tremendously from a strict authoritarian rule which preserves a stratified and hierarchical order often based upon family blood relations as in a Bedouin tribe for instance to the complete abrogation of right and wrong of direct parent parental responsibility and even clear genealogical relatedness, and the rejection of moral and worldly authority that are found in an anarchistic commune. I will not go into the democratic solution, yet clearly a society that has written on its flag that all men are crea created equal may find it difficult to accept and digest the notion of an inherent inequality, such as that between parents and children. The last point in this connection has to do with the role of fantasy. Now Freud, first, he first understood the infantile sexual roots of neurosis as an actual traumatic event, perpetrated by a seductive, and abusive adult. Freud made a huge departure from this view when he traded this earlier theory for a later one in which infantile sexual wishes 
are seen to exist universally, to press for satisfaction, and to find expression and fulfillment through fantasies, the contents of which may be of having been seduced, among others. With this change, he also established the Oedipus complex as a universal phenomenon of developmental significance. Yet by this shift of emphasis from actual seduction and trauma to wish fulfillment and fantasy, Freud pulled the rug from under ordinary reliance upon experience and the normal information provided by our senses. The most revolutionizing impact of Freud's legacy is therefore to be found in its alteration of the relative position of rationality and along with rationality of the place and nature of reality. It is as if the rules of the game have suddenly been changed. For at least two centuries before Freud, people were gradually and increasingly led to trust in the powers of their rational mind, to rely on natural observation as a method of discovery, and to hail the legitimacy of utilitarian and adaptive reason. From the 18th century onward, the age of enlightenment, emancipation, and reason prevailed. Modern modernity meant the efficacy of science, the supremacy of rationality, and the ultimate value of seeking freedom from irrational fears and being governed solely by adaptive, that is, by utilitarian and rational goals. Modern man sees himself as very different from his predecessors. They may have been unenlightened, superstitious, and ready to accept dependency on supernatural powers and authorities. Unlike them, however, modern man prides himself on his reason, which he equates with his consciousness, on his freedom from primitive impulses, urges, and fears, and on the unquestioned superiority of motivations that are rationally and adaptively geared to what is best for the individual. Democracy, founded on political liberalism and economic socialism and social welfare, is vitally founded on these beliefs and values, which basically provide the underpinnings for equality of opportunities and rights. The attack on man's capacity for living by reason and rationality, proclaimed by Nietzsche and driven home by Freud, undermines these foundations. Instead, it paves the way for postmodernistic subversion and revolution, based upon shifting the emphasis to the power and inevitable impact of the forces of irrationality to all that is not necessarily adaptive or utilitarian, yet still exerts tremendous influence. Indeed, as Professor Sternhall of my university has recently stated, Freud's teachings may be regarded as the negation of modernism and one of the influences that ushered in the postmodern reaction which found its political expression in fascism. Both, however, trends are so much trends of the 20th century. We may already have noted a certain split or ambivalence in Freud himself in this regard. On the one hand, as I have pointed out, he was deeply committed to a positivistic and materialistic position. He carefully distinguished material, objective reality, from psychic 
or subjective reality. He asserted that psychic reality stems from, is influenced by, and may perhaps eventually be regulated by recourse even to biochemical means. On the other hand, however, Freud employed the logical processes of scientific thought, the powers of observation and deduction, to create a subversive world picture no longer governed by these processes and their adaptive logic. The world after Freud is ruled by internal forces that answer the calling of tension release, the seeking of pleasure and satisfaction of instinctual longings, which is so different than that of adaptation, reason and rationality with which they actually are in conflict. Man's capacity and need for adaptation is not, however, overlooked or minimized by Freud. In fact, it is always there, implicitly or explicitly, as in his early ego instincts of self-preservation, which I've mentioned, or in the much later recognition of the ego as the subsystem of the mind dedicated to the cause of adaptation. But once again, Freud also insists on pointing out that portions of the same ego operate outside of consciousness and are actually doing so in the service of defense and resistance to therapeutic change. That is, the same ego that is dedicated to adaptation is undermining the cure of the person himself. Once again, therefore, Adaptation is seen to be a limited function, limited by its own built-in irrational components and tendencies. There is small wonder that Freud's outlook on life and man's capacities for survival and adaptation were sober and pessimistic. This comes across in a number of his writings, as, for instance, in his correspondence titled Why War?, in 1932 with Albert Einstein, who will, of course, also be discussed in this series. Freud's unhidden pessimism derives from his theoretical views and clinical acquaintance with human nature. At the same time, we cannot but experience his pessimism in the context of a 20th century response to two great wars and a number of not much smaller ones to the Holocaust and genocide that go on unperturbed in this century, which is undoubtedly also the century of some of man's greatest scientific and technological achievements. This 20th century face is, however, exactly what Freud saw and described as human nature. If I'm allowed time for a very brief summary, I have attempted to take you on a bird's eye tour of Freud's influence on the 20th century and the Freudian revolution as I see it, which contains some profound ideas and observations about man's nature and dynamics, formulated loosely into a sort of a theory. Psychoanalysis as the embodiment of this theory, though not necessarily as a method of therapy, has pointed the spotlight at these dark sides of human nature and gave us a palpable feel for its huge proportions. Looked at from this angle, the relative weights of reason and rationality, judgment and reality assessment seem very small, while infantile erotic fantasies and fantasy life at large, instinctual drives and unconscious material, mental and spiritual forces all loom very large. It is a little like holding up a candle in a dark room and seeing the shadows cast by the furnishings, which loom very large indeed. Now, did Freud actually exaggerate the true proportions of rational versus irrational forces or the unconscious as against the conscious mind? Did he feel compelled to magnify these so as to make his bewildering arguments at the time 
more telling? I do not think so. I do feel that these ideas were unpopular when they first ad uh, were advanced and that they are not really any more popular now. They have received some acceptance in int intellectual parlor talk and have even achieved a certain fashionability, though not necessarily respectability. I believe they have deeply affected this century's character, however, as they heralded the difficulties that we had to face and withstand in it. In some way, they may even have contributed to the unleashing of these evil, evil spirits. This is so because in some way, as human beings, we find it difficult to live with the truth about our own nature. The confrontation with our nature and makeup may not always be therapeutic in its effects, especially when it takes place outside the purview of therapeutic practice. Yet ideas, whether popular or not, possess potency and great power. It is in this sense that Freud's ideas have had a genuine, deep, and lasting effect upon all of us in this century and probably in many more to come. Thank you. Uh, we have time, I understand, for questions. If there are any, I'd be happy to entertain some. Yes, please. Oh, um, Charcot was considered by Freud as one of his early teachers. Um, Charcot went, uh, Freud went to study with him, as you know, um, in Paris. Uh, Charcot knew a great deal at the time about hysteria and was one of the people who had uh, one of these pre-Freudian conceptions of the unconscious uh, that influenced Freud's early work, the work he did eventually with uh, Breuer, was founded upon the work he did with Charcot. But Freud very quickly went beyond Charcot's own work uh, in the sense, as I said, that ideas mainly were not simply dissociated and put out of consciousness and from there... Uh, could only be gotten at through hypnosis, for instance, as Charcot said, but as something that pressed on for expression uh, even beyond symptoms. Well, that sounds very interesting, and I, I would suggest that um, perhaps a topic for another lecture, that is Charcot's contribution to creativity. Hmm. Well, are there any others? Yes, please. Are there any easier ones? Um, look, I think I don't mean to uh, to make this a laughing matter. I think it's a very serious one. I take the question as a serious one. Um, <coughs> You know, uh, all I can say about that is that psychoanalysts are still struggling with the attempt to understand this. Uh, there have been a number of uh, symposia and writings on it. It is very difficult to summarize this. Um, some people 
uh, will emphasize, as I have in this talk, the role and place of the destructive, aggressive drives. Others will emphasize other matters which have more to do with uh, that closer to the social plane. Um, it, it is so uh, huge an issue that I think the, the, the only beginning attempts um, to understand this, there was a whole issue of a journal devoted to this. Let me see if I can, if I'm not mistaken, it was the uh, contempt, psychoanalysis and contemporary thought that devoted an entire issue to this, and there are other writings as well. Um, I can also tell you that, psycholytically speaking, um, I have personally had contact, as has been mentioned before, with German psychoanalysts, uh, and it was quite bewildering to me personally to see how difficult it is still to discuss this. And since we are, I'm here tonight as a representative of the Sigmund Freud Center, I can tell you that uh, later on this year, in uh, the, end, the end of May, beginning of June, we are planning a, a week uh, group relations conference for German and Israeli analysts, an experiential conference, not a scientific one, uh, in which we hope to bring about 50 people together from both sides um, in an effort to use this format to try again to understand some of this. And I think essentially we are all rather humble in front of this uh, calamity. And, you know, I think it is very difficult to explain it psychologically or any other way. Um, maybe we should take another question and somebody else. Yes, Roger. I said that I think so. Yes. Oh, yes. Theory of what? Hmm. Well, you know, uh, Freud in this sense is a little bit like the Bible or the Talmud. You can find some way of proving everything. That is, both minimizes it and then again he comes and says, as in the address that I quoted, that this is his inner identity. After for years and years he has really stayed away. Again, you know, uh, the other problem, of course, is that there, so much has been written about Freud. Uh, he is one of the more popular heroes of the century in this way. And there have been many attempts to understand him and study him. And one of the studies uh, is this question of his Jewishness. Um, I've been interested in this ever since I was a graduate student, and uh, I wrote a paper, and then much later I found out that uh, people have actually written in a very similar vein to what I've written all sorts of, of books uh, and books going on and speculating about all sorts of very small aspects. For instance, the fact that Freud says in one place he doesn't understand Hebrew or Yiddish. And then there's evidence actually that he did and used Yiddish words, uh, not Hebrew, but Yiddish words. Um, he says um, that he uh, is not religious. And of course, he, he was not only not religious, he was in some ways ardently anti-religious. I mean, his uh, future of an, uh, of an illusion is one of the, I think, most uh, devastating attacks on religion that has ever been uh, written. Um, and yet, at the same time, uh, Freud does not, for instance, ever turn back on his Jewishness. He lives in Vienna, where there's a tremendous pressure to convert. And many Jews... Uh, uh, succumb to if they want to get ahead. Uh, he, for instance, believed, and apparently rightly so, that for a long time his, uh, his professorship at the university was denied him anti-Semitically uh, and because of his uh, Jewishness, and yet he would not convert, as people like, let's say, Mahler and 
others have done, you know, who wanted to be accepted in Viennese society. Um, he uh, takes a cane against uh, uh, some uh, uh, rowdy people, rowdy guys who, who attack him, you know, and his son as he walks in the woods and pursues them. Uh, he is ashamed of the fact that his father uh, bent, uh, his father bent down to pick up his cap, which a ruffian threw down, you know, and, and in this way he uh, demeaned himself and so on and so forth. These are all biographical tidbits that come up throughout the story of Freud and that uh, essentially uh, indicate that he was, as many Jews are and uh, were in, in Vienna and elsewhere, very deeply ambivalent about their being Jewish. Now, ambivalence also means a tremendous investment. I mean, it was certainly not a, a matter of, uh, of indifference to him. Uh, at the same time, I think it's correct to say that as he grew older and also as the uh, course of events in Europe became more and more openly anti-Semitic, um, he became more openly Jewish. And uh, he says so in a, uh, um, an interview that he gave to a, a journalist uh, in the year, I think it's around, it's the end of the 20s or 1930, something like that, forget the exact year, in which he says that I am really uh, no longer uh, part of the German culture. I am a Jew. Okay, so, you know, I don't know if this answers the question, but I think it is a thread that goes through his development. I can also mention, of course, his association with my university, but that's a whole chapter in itself. You know, he was on the board of trustees and he uh, was negotiating with the university for a chair in psychoanalysis back in the 1930s and so on and so forth. Um, so even though he was not a Zionist, and he, he says so, I'm not a Zionist, I would never go there, but he supports very much Eitingon, Max Eitingon, his uh, disciple, when Eitingen, uh actually fled from Germany, where he had founded the Berlin Institute, the first psychoanalytic institute as an institute, and went to then Palestine to found the Israel, what is now the Israel Psychoanalytic Institute. And Freud says, you know, I, I wouldn't do it, I'm not a Zionist, but I fully support you in this. Yes. Well, uh, there's a complication in what you're asking, because essentially, I think, if I understand correctly, <clears throat> these applications that you're talking about come not from psychoanalysis, by and large, but from various uh, subfields within academic psychology. And in academic psychology, uh, certainly uh, prediction is uh, something which is entertained. It's not always successful but it is something that to some extent, uh, at least theoretically, is part of the game. Whereas in psychoanalysis, prediction is even theoretically a very difficult issue, not uh, to be easily undertaken. But post-diction is what, uh, what one engages in. Why? Uh, simply because the what if I restrict myself not to psychoanalysis, not to uh, academic psychology, um, what psychoanalysis does, uh, especially in its uh, application as a method of treatment, is to go back in the life of an individual. That is, to go with the present and from the present and the past in the present. And in that sense, it explains 
what is in terms of what was. But it makes it still very difficult, or it remains still very difficult, to say what will be. Now, an astute uh, psychoanalyst, as a good clinician, or as many good clinicians uh, will do, might be able to undertake certain predictions. But these, first of all, have to be undertaken cautiously. And secondly, they, they do not have the, the value of a scientific prediction. They are a very specific prediction in a given case. But it is very difficult to make generalizations about people's behavior under, so to speak, uh, specifiable circumstances in terms of how they will behave. Yes, please. My prediction? <laughs> Hmm. Well, I don't know what my prediction would be. I can tell you what my hope will be. Uh, my uh, look, I don't think psychoanalysis is not, was not, and I don't, I don't think will ever be a mass treatment method. It's not conceived as such. Uh, not everybody can be treated psychoanalytically. I personally, as a psychoanalyst, don't think necessarily that everybody should be treated psychoanalytically. But I am very happy to have this tool when I see someone who I think can benefit from it and I can offer it to him and I can suggest. Believe it or not, very often, even though you suggest it to people and you are you do the best prediction you can, and you say that this is really the right thing for you. Uh, people don't, uh, don't always accept it. They might be afraid of it, they might be hesitant, they might have resistances, and so on and so forth. So just the fact that you offer it doesn't mean that it's accepted. But at any rate, I, to come back to your question, I certainly hope that in one form or another, psychoanalysis as a method of treatment will be around for, I don't want to say how long, but you know, for many years to come, because I think it is a very unique method. Uh, it is unique in the sense that once you are willing to undertake it and to accept the rigors, really, of the uh, requirements that it imposes in terms of time, and of course payment and so on. It's not an easy burden, uh, usually, although sometimes psychoanalysis also practice at, at low fee, but we won't talk about that. Uh, but once it is done, um, it is something which affords a much greater freedom for an internal investigation than any other method that I know of. And it's it is precisely because in psychoanalysis, and this is something that Freud really put down very strongly, we do not engage in suggestion. That is, in most other therapies, there is some form usually of suggestion. Now, suggestion I'm using now as a generic term, not as a particular one. But for instance, if a, a therapist, and I'm not saying this necessarily critically, but if, he's, if he advises a patient about something, this is suggestion because he's using his authority as somebody that the patient respects and has uh, usually positive feelings towards and so on and so forth to guide him in a particular direction, which is what people may often actually wish somebody would do for them. And in psychoanalysis, this is not the case. At least it's not supposed to be the case. Okay? Um, to what extent this is actually true or not is always debatable. Some people think that even though analysts refrain from suggestion, uh, they practice it sort of covertly. I don't think this is true. I, I don't think that people who are psycholytically trained in any fashion, really, of psych there are many differences, many different schools today of psychoanalysis, of course. But I think that that's one of the things that unites them, that is the anti uh, suggestive stance. 
And I personally hope that this will be around because I think that we need uh, such methods of treatment in which one is allowed, as I said, the freedom to explore and investigate without penalties of criticism or even advice, which can be a penalty sometimes, but really, you know, struggle with it himself. Yes, please. Uh, well, Freud, uh, as you know, wrote one, actually, he dated uh, the origin of psychoanalysis to his book on dreams, which came out in 1900. So it is the beginning of the 20th century. And in this book, which is actually a truly, again, monumental book in itself, I mean, if you just look at it as a, a piece of work, it is a, a very impressive dissertation about the state of the art, about the, all the theories about dreams that existed in his days and before his days. He takes them up one by one, dozens of them, uh, until he comes to his own. Now, Freud, as you know, regarded dreams as the uh, royal road to the unconscious. And this is so because, uh, and I will not go you know, into the metapsychology of this, but because dreams um, occur in a, what he considered a regressed or regressive state, namely sleep, in which uh, there, the usual kind of rational adaptive uh, awareness um, and consciousness that uh, I described uh, is not what uh, usually counts. And so, in, in a way, dreams then reflect or become a product of those strata of the mind that are not the usual conscious, everyday ones. And because of that, and because of the, the rules that then govern the, the dream formation, it is possible to obtain through the dream a picture, so to speak, of not the, the entire unconscious, although, of course, you can get ideas about how it operates, but about specific contents that come up through the dream. If you then generalize from this about the kind of thought processes that go on in this state, and you say that these are the thought processes, that is, the thinking that goes on in dreams is really the kind of thinking that is typical of the unconscious, you can even generalize and generate certain rules about what it is to think unconsciously. Um, so in that sense, Freud used dreams, um, both theoretically and, of course, clinically. Now, clinically, a dream would be used in the course of treatment uh, to gain better understanding. Uh, nowadays, it is not certainly not the only uh, tool or not even the main tool. I think the main tool has shifted to be the analysis of the so-called transference. But dreams are still used. How much people will use them and in what way and how they will interpret them and so on depends, I think, somewhat or to some extent on the theoretical background of the particular psychoanalytic school that they come from. Okay, one more and we'll finish. Yes. No, no. I, what I'm implying is that a theory, uh, and particularly the discovery and the invention of a theory, is something which must be regarded within a context. And the context is in some ways cultural. It's not only cultural, but it is in some ways cultural. And a culture provides the bed, so to speak, in which a particular sprout can begin to take hold and, and grow. And, of course, these are 
obviously generalizations, but uh, if one thinks of the uh, of the English, or for that matter, the development of American scientific thought, the kind of thinking that went into forming psychoanalysis would have had an even greater difficulty here than it did have in Vienna. Not that it didn't have difficulties there too, but it was more readily acceptable. This is what I mean to say, that in, on a relative basis, that the fact of the matter is that uh, American psychology, even though it had invited Freud to come over and was one of the first uh, outside uh, elements that have recognized Freud, the famous Clark lectures, which he was invited to give, were a tribute. Um, it took uh, a very long time and is still uh, within the academic psychological community a not particularly well accepted uh, method. And uh, on the other hand, American psychology uh, was for a long time ruled and has created really uh, behaviorism, which is a much more meaningful product, I think, of this culture than psychoanalysis is. Psychoanalysis in some ways is a transplant, and it was brought over when, because of what happened in Europe, so many psychoanalysts fled from Europe and many of them came here. You know, So in that sense, psychoanalysis in itself, so to speak, is not really, uh, it's hard to see it as an American creation. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org. <laughs>